All right. Well, Dad, we have a, a very special guest on the podcast today. This is an episode I've been looking forward to for a, well, a few weeks now since we have set it up. And we've called today's episode Demystifying Adult ADHD with Dr. Oz Yelchin. So uh, Dr. Oscar Yelchin is a clinical psychologist with extensive experience treating complex mental health conditions. Being diagnosed with ADHD himself later in life, he has a particular interest in adult ADHD. He has served as the former WA State Chair of the APS College of Clinical Psychologists and is a board-approved supervisor and sessional academic. Oz has published in the neurosciences and on psychometric assessment with his PhD focusing on enhancing the assessment of early maladaptive schemas and the development of the YSQR, or the young, uh, which is the Young Schema Questionnaire. He is also the director of the Anima Health Network, a clinical psychology and neuropsychology practice in Western Australia, which specializes in assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of acute mental health conditions and brain-based disorders. So, Oz, welcome to the podcast, and thanks so much for jumping on with us. Uh, thank you for the intro, um, and thank you so much for having me uh, on uh, on this episode. I'm, yeah, I feel privileged. Thank you so much. It's terrific, Oz. Thanks so much for joining us. And we met, of course, earlier this year at a chair work workshop. We've actually had a podcast on chair work, but we, we met when the same small group doing practice together with that. And I really enjoyed meeting with you there. And uh, and so just, yeah, wonderful having you on our program on Psych Spills. Thanks very much. Thank you. No, that was, it was a really great uh, um, experience, actually. And it was, it was wonderful to share it with you. So thank you so much. Yeah, it was, it was, and obviously, you know, as we've spoken about, it's kind of like, you know, changed, I think, both of our practices, but, you know, that's a topic for another time, I think. <laughs> sure, sure, Oz, great. Absolutely. Well, Oz, I think it's a pertinent time that we are getting you on because it's, it seems that there's a fair bit more emphasis on ADHD in popular culture and even things like media these days. I can even think of a few more maybe TV show characters that pop up that might have some ADHD traits and before we jumped on today, I had a look at, at TikTok, for example, which for whatever reason seems to be a bit of an arbiter of popular culture these days. And for the hashtag ADHD, it's up to nearly 30 billion views uh, for, for that particular subject. And there was also a recent study that came out which suggested that around 52% of the content on TikTok related to HD, uh, ADHD included either misinformation or was misinforming in some way. So I think it is really good to get you on as an expert to be able to maybe get to the bottom of, of some of the misconceptions and uh, and what information is out there. And, and yeah, it'll be, it'll be great to have this discussion with you today. But I suppose first to start, maybe a little bit broadly, what is ADHD and how might it most commonly present? Ooh. Uh, firstly, I'll just go back into. Um, I will never pretend to be an expert on anything. Um, I'm a, I'm a forever student, um, but I'll like absolutely do my best to, you know, draw on my clinical knowledge and my own personal experience, obviously. So. <laughs> And look, um, I might just say there too, Oz, I think that's a very wise position to take, but you are very knowledgeable in this area. And I know that you've done training in this area, but also the fact that you have life experience adds another dimension, we believe. And so, yeah, we'll see how it goes, but I think it's it's great to be able to have some informed information in this area uh, against that context that Rowan described. Well, thank you. Um, so, I guess like when we think about like misinformation, I suspect, well, social media is a bit of a, um, I guess a bit of a hot pot, isn't it, for, uh, you know, short videos and, um, and, and you know, attributing certain characteristics or behaviours to various different things. And, um, you know, I guess in the, in the world of, uh, uh, you know, psychological difficulties ADHD seems to be at the moment uh one that's I don't know gathered quite a bit of interest um you know I think I think it's probably something you know this literally just came to mind right so uh why is soccer the most um uh well-known sport in the world it's because everybody can play it right mm. and like everybody can kick a ball and so not like taking the piss out of soccer players <laughs> um, or the game respectfully, but you see my point, right? And I think um, when we think about ADHD, uh, there are lots and lots of uh, 
I guess, features or um, behaviours that, you know, we would all have uh, and that we would then, I guess, you know, I guess liken to X. We all, we're all creatures uh, that need to bond with something. We need to bond with something. And sometimes people look externally um, at sometimes labels or other types of things to help them feel, uh, uh, you know, connected in some way. But also, you know, if you think about even ads, like so if you if you go back, you know, 20 years, um, a, a movie was a movie or an ad was an ad that went for some time. Now what, uh, you know, what, what in, intentionally, everything is like in very short bursts. You have 10 seconds or 15 seconds or, you know, 30 seconds and, you know, you watch a Netflix, I mean, it's all designed in this way, right? So a, a new series comes out and all of the episodes are 30 minutes um, so that you can watch one after another. And another. So, so it's constantly this kind of like stuff that's grabbing our attention. And I, I would say more generally because of that kind of stuff, you know, maybe people's attentions have been affected overall, like um, almost shaped by, uh, by these kind of like, you know, more social norms now, uh, yeah, so that, that reminds me, we did actually have an episode based partly on the book Stolen Focus that gets across that, that a lot of social media encourages this, this uh, brief, well, a brief attention spans. And so I suppose partly from what you're suggesting too, there could be a risk of many people over-identifying with ADHD because it can overlap with just normal reactions, but also there can be an under-recognition at times and it can make a difference when people are, if you like, accurately diagnosed or identified as having ADHD. So how, how would, would you describe like what, what is ADHD so people can maybe have a more realistic appraisal, if you like, of the nature of ADHD? Yeah, look, I guess based on that comment, um, Chris, thank you. You know, I think it's really, really actually important the uh, way that people um, appraise these kind of things or identify with them. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is OCD. Now, you know, when people are like, oh, I'm so OCD, right? Um, I kind of find that a little bit offensive because I treat people with OCD and it is absolutely chronic and debilitating for some people. And it's very difficult to treat uh, in, on, on, on some, uh, um, you know, in some presentations. Right. And so um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's really important to, I guess, be aware of the language and things like that and how people do identify with these kind of things um, because you have a shorter attention span or because, you know, you might not be able to focus or, Pay or concentrate, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you have ADHD or, you know, because you're very particular in certain ways of doing things, it doesn't mean you have OCD. Uh, and so um, uh, to, what was the question again? Sorry, Chris. Yeah, so just say, how would you describe what, what is ADHD? How, how do we identify it more realistically? Okay. Um, so I think the best way really is... Uh, through a proper um, assessment process. Um, you know, if we think about what that looks like, so for example, at my clinic, um, like ADHD is not a, is a diagnosis of um, uh, exclusion, not inclusion. For the very things that we're talking about here, there are so many symptoms of ADHD that overlap with so many other things. And so actually what we need to do is actually see uh, when we kind of take all of those other things out, what's left over? And is it ADHD? And then we can be confident that that's true. So we will obviously screen for many other mental health conditions uh, that are comorbid trauma being one of them. I think we'll probably talk a bit, bit about this later on. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, really teasing that stuff apart is, is, is really important um, and having a very proper thorough diagnostic assessment that uh, differentiates all of those things. And, and quite often a neuropsychological component will uh, be very, very helpful uh, in identifying strengths and weaknesses. And um, often you'll see that uh, people with ADHD have uh, uh, working memory deficits or more, more so than general processing speed deficits, more so than general um, and uh, and because of uh, you know because of the the nature of the assessment, you can make recommendations that are actually going to be really helpful for uh, a person. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is such a good point about, say, ADHD and OCD and how they can bleed into popular culture, for lack of a better term, uh, sometimes. And like I even think, for example, Oz, you know, you go on a holiday, for example, and the first day of the holiday, you've brought a book along to read. And obviously in your everyday life, you might be on social media a little bit more. And as you say, there's maybe some competing factors for our attention. And for example, you might find your your mind wanders a little bit on the first day of the holiday when you're trying to read your book, but say by the fifth or sixth day of reading your book, you're a lot better at actually sitting down and, and working your way through it. And I think that's such a good point not to conflate those two things of, you know, maybe in, in society today, there are uh, some limitations on our on our attention. And, and as I say, some competing factors for our attention, but it doesn't necessarily mean that someone has maybe clinical ADHD. It seems that that is maybe a, a, a slightly stronger condition, which can lead to or some more issues for people than, than more oh. flippantly saying, you know, I've got an attention issue right at the moment. Yeah. And so for, the first thing is I could never actually sit down and read a book for five, you know, for an hour, let alone five days. <laughs> um, but uh, the other thing I think um, was, <laughs> uh, you're right. So, so the other the other really important thing to consider there is um, that you know there has to be these symptoms have to persist across multiple domains. They can't just be in one setting. You know, you have to experience the same types of things um, in uh, at work or at school or at home, and um, and so that that's another really important thing to to keep in mind. Um, it can't just be domain specific. There has to be a um, a real kind of um, impairment across multiple areas of life. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, and one thing that you're really highlighting there is there's a nature of assessment, which is quite specific and goes into detail. And so if I think of it um, generally as a clinical psychologist, what I have come to mind for looking to get a hint of um, ADHD, it's when people have a cluster of five different um, uh, patterns, if you like. And you might elaborate on this, how this goes, but I look for when people acknowledge having a short attention span. For example, they look to go and do shopping and it's hard to remember more than just a few items and come home having forgot a couple, even if there are only four or five items they're looking to get. And being distractible, being disorganised, tending to procrastinate and tending to be impulsive. But like as you're suggesting, uh, well, short attention span and distractibility, even being disorganized, well, depression contribute to those things as well. Uh, also, people might be procrastinating also with uh, depression or other reactions um, that the people have. So it can over these are general patterns that can overlap with a range of things. But when you see people who come through that assessment process and you consider that they do have, you've assessed them as having ADHD, what are some of the ways that that presents or comes across to you? What do you notice about that that seems that really fits more the, if you like, the actual condition rather than something that mimics it? Yeah, that, that's a that's a really good question. And, and honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, emotion dysregulation which is odd, not any of those things that you mentioned, but would actually, uh, that actually fit into the criteria as you see in the DSM-5. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, emotion, emotion regulation problems are a, um, uh, are not, are not, are not a criteria, are not on the um, main criteria for ADHD, which is mind boggling to me. Uh, I, I don't understand that. It is, like baffling <laughs> that that is not a, um, a primary symptom of um, ADHD because it is so prominent in uh, the 70 plus percent of people. This is like, you know, based on stats and not just me making that up, but like my own clinical experience is, is that, um, you know, you see people uh, with, um, you know, all of those things are absolute indicators too. So that they would definitely warrant investigation, um, but, uh, you know, as as we kind of like said before about really uh, really asking the right questions and and trying to tease apart whether it's social anxiety or whether it's depression or whether it's something else. And so, um, you know, the forgetfulness thing. And the other thing is, you might look, uh, you know, you might look at things like substance use. So substance use, when someone comes in and talks, that's you know, like a you know, they drink too much or they're, they're relying on other kind of substances uh, uh, or you know, even even kind of like stimulating substances 
cocaine or uh, yeah, speed or whatever it might be um, as a way of self-regulating. Uh, and actually, it was not, not a substance use disorder per se. It's actually driven by um, undiagnosed ADHD. I've seen that heaps of times. Okay, um, and attempt to self-medicate, right. Um, well, it's actually more about like, I need, to, you know, my brain needs to get what it's supposed to get and I'm not getting it. And so how do I get it, right? right. Uh, it's like a, it's a stimulating, it's a self-stimulating kind of process, right? So um, that's from a more neurobiological kind of um, perspective. But the other thing is like um, anxious rumination, right? So rumination is a massive problem across, um, you know, uh, anxiety disorders and all of that kind of stuff. It is so prevalent in ADHD. You know, people like might say something like, um, I go to bed and um, my brain doesn't turn off. It just is just constantly going. I can't stop. It just goes from one thing to another thing. and doesn't even make sense. That's another clinical indicator. There's another thing that I would, um, I would then start looking for ADHD as well as obviously the anxiety stuff, right? But what happens when an ADHD brain is quiet? It's like quiet is not good <laughs> you okay. need something right and so um it's like your brain is almost uh like um you know um, creating the stimulation for you and then when you see these patients and they um you know start on appropriate like um you know the stimulant medication and all that kind of stuff what happens to the noise goes away it's okay. unbelievable right so um and and you know, like I had a, a lady, I'll try and like make this so it's completely de-identified. <laughs> um, but I had a lady uh, that I saw, um, that I've continued to see uh, about six, uh, no, about 12 months ago I started. And they were um, referred to me for uh, substance use. Um, and they'd had an admission to like detox and all of this kind of stuff. And um, I like, you know, kind of like talking. And, and so they were talking about like uh, drinking, right? So drinking too much. And so I was like, well, so when do you drink? Oh, do I drink at nighttime, you know, so you go to work, drink at nighttime. Um, and uh, like when you wake up, do you like crave uh, an, like a drink? Do you, do you, do you need one? No. Um, do you kind of like, you know, do you think about it? Are you preoccupied with it a lot of the time? Um, you know, sometimes, but not really. As so you're looking at these patterns in the evening, so people, you know, people are kind of like, drink. I'm like, and of, of course, with a whole bunch of other factors considered, I'm like, you've got actually got ADHD. Like this is, I don't think this is a, a drinking issue, right? Um, of course, the drinking issue is a part of a wider problem, but um uh, so once they obviously started to, um, once they were, you know, prescribed the appropriate medication, things like that, um, the drinking like, uh, has ceased for like the last eight months. So not a single drink. Right. And so that's kind of not just medication stuff. That's obviously ongoing treatment and regular therapy and, and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's, it's really important to kind of like, you know, really assess this stuff properly, uh, Yes, so there yeah, could be different purpose. <laughs> yes, so there could be different purpose for the um substance abuse and sort of being attentive to that with ADHD can um can help sort of noticing how people are using it for the stimulant um function. But um are there different types of ADHD? And I, I suppose that uh, many people would be aware that you know there's a hyperactivity aspect for many people, but there also can be a, a primarily inattentive subtype. But I'm wondering if if you tend to have different, if you like, categories or subtypes that that you think of in terms of how ADHD can present. Um, I don't know. I think this is a bit of a tricky one. Like, um, like a part of me uh, thinks that you know the uh, hyperactivity and the you know inattention i mean they're all they're the same like that that's what it seems like a lot of the time uh another part uh, says that um there are lots of individual differences and in some way there is some research there that shows kind of like different uh uh levels of i guess capacities to process uh sensory information 
um, which is another factor. Um, and uh, what else? So, yeah, so so it's like in attendance. So there might be so in a nutshell, there might be lots of lots and lots of subtypes. Um, or it's kind of like at the moment, it just seems it's everything's just kind of like one really. Um, so take for take for instance, um, hyperactivity. So it, so in a child, um, it's much clearer. You can see the hyperactivity from right? people. Uh, you know that trouble. You know with impulse control and you know what else you might typically think uh, of a hyperactive child. Um, but of course, you know over over time, um the you know society doesn't we can't act like a hyperactive child as an adult and so we learn to some ways manage that so we don't get off our, off our seat when we're having a meeting with people because we learn that that's not appropriate um but the physical manifestations of that are still present so people might be fidgeting all the time or you know restless leg or you know, moving around, like looking, like stimulate, self-stimulating essentially in some ways, right? So, um, or the anxious ruminations that serve as a hyperactive, um, almost like symptom of ADHD. Uh, you might have people who talk a lot, you know, they, you can't get a word in, right? Uh, they talk and talk and talk and talk. It's another kind of symptom as an adult. And so uh, they just kind of manifest in different ways. Um, but it's still kind of there. And of course, the the inattention stuff is, I guess, uh, uh, probably present also in hyperactive, in, in the hyperactive subtype, as it is in the other one. But uh, like I said, you can't always just see the symptoms. There might be internal kind of processes that are, uh, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, certainly. And it seems that maybe with females as well, we are learning a little bit more about ways that they're masked in childhood and that potentially leads to some diagnosis later in life as we learn a little bit more about, I suppose, how they mask it and how it does show up when they do have that ability. But that, I suppose, in some ways leads to my next question. It's a bit of a, a two-pronged question, Oz, but I suppose what causes ADHD? And one thing I wonder is, is it something that can be acquired throughout life or is it more likely that someone's been born with ADHD? Yeah, that, that's that's the most likely uh, answer there. Like there's heritability of ADHD is... Um, you know, above 75%. And so, you know, if, um, if you, if you've got person, basically, uh, a, a, a person that comes in with, um, uh, that you, that you identify as got ADHD, yeah, at least one or both of their parents are going to have ADHD. And so, um, so if I'm like even assessing a kid or a teenager or something like that, uh, you know, and the parents coming on, like, okay, so which one of you have ADHD, right? So they, maybe both maybe you maybe you, i don't know let's talk about it right so and then like they would start unpacking it a bit and they're like ah oh, okay right? <laughs> um so they're the, they're the kind of fortunate ones there there are some that are less fortunate and I, I guess we can probably talk about this a little bit later in terms of like the uh psychosocial implications of 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 this disorder and how it's kind of like not uh, well, how it might manifest and and then perpetuate. Um, but generally, there's uh, you know, the heritability is high, and the other thing is like I don't know if this kind of answers the question or is it is a little bit off. But you know, the neurobiology of people with ADHD are uh, different a little bit as well. So, um, so I won't, I won't bore you with sort of jargon, but you know, in in our brain, we've got white matter and grey matter. Now uh, the white matter is uh, the cells do, do, the, the, the have axons that connect to each of the neurons. And basically those, um, they, they transmit information. And uh, around each uh, neuron, there's a uh, thing called a myelin sheath. So uh, that's the uh, conductor of the, the speed. So you might think about things like, you know, like dial-up internet versus, um, you know, what is it now? Uh, and is it or uh, high speed internet or MBN or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, so as people develop, um, uh, the myelination doesn't develop with it, and so you see people with ADHD as have that that sort of connectivity is less, so the information is not being transmitted as as fast as it might be for a, a neurotypical person. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, and also the, the the circuitry as well, they kind of like. Um, 
uh, you know, the frontal limbic kind of circuitry where uh, the front of the brain is talking to the back of the brain, um, where you've got like top down and bottom up processes. So the top down processes are the front of your brain uh, trying to uh, inhibit uh, physiological responses and, and, and vice versa. And so if there's a problem with that, then you have uh, difficulties with managing your behavior or blurting something out or you know if you've got anxiety um, that's going to overtake your capacity to say uh, that's cool like don't worry about it it's nothing to worry about right or you know if you kind of like um, you know if I, if, if I look at you and then you look at me in a kind of puzzled way or in a, a disconcerted way um, my anxiety might go up and I might have difficulty then actually using my frontal lobe to say uh, that's cool. They could have been thinking about something else or it's actually got nothing to do with you. I might now get stuck on this idea um, because now I'm like focused on my body feelings. Uh, does that does that make sense? Is that too much? <laughs> Sometimes it might be difficult also to inhibit certain reactions then. For example, as you, as you say, thoughts come up and it might be more difficult to, yeah, to, to, to curb that and move on, so to speak. But um, now, now one thing that's just so helpful, I think, in your situation, Oz, is you've been prepared to describe, hey, look, you know, uh, I have ADHD myself. And so uh, I, I think it'd be very helpful for people to understand just by example. Um, first of all, how did you become aware of it? in the first place yeah um yeah so I, I guess uh you know i was uh where was it it was a few years ago now it must be maybe three years ago maybe a bit more um maybe three years ago uh i was um stuck on my phd um but i guess in typical ADHD fashion, which I didn't know uh, at the time. Um, I was a therapy manager at a psychiatric hospital. I had a, a private practice, like a solo private practice, and I was halfway through my PhD um, and I was just struggling, like just hit the wall. And I'm just, uh, and I, just I just couldn't figure it out. Um, you know, the admin stuff had always been very challenging. Um, um, and, you know, paying attention to those, like clinically things were always good, you know, or any, any kind of like engagements or interactions were always good, were always easier. Um, uh, but when, when it came to, when it came to doing, um, you know, the more challenging things, I was sitting down and reading research papers and all of that kind of stuff. And even sometimes just basic, you know, admin stuff, um, you know, I was kind of like in this state of frozenness, um, it just, they just couldn't get out of it. And uh, my wife and I were in bed one day and we had the ASRS and we're kind of like ticking off symptoms together. It's like yeah. this is the you might give like a screening questionnaire. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, having a bit of a chuckle about it uh, and then doing nothing for another six months uh, because I was just like, um, and one of my, I guess, hesitations uh, around that was the idea of speaking to a colleague and uh, them uh, perceiving me to be an impaired practitioner or, um, you, know, uh, you know, damaged in some way or not being able to, you know, uh, you know function in my job or perform my job uh and things like that and i think that's not an uncommon fear that, that people have so anyway i i was in the consulting room so so i practiced out of the consulting rooms as well with the psychiatrist and um there's a colleague there who uh, you know, specializes in, in adhd and i i uh, thought you've got to do something about this so i said oh i want to talk to you about a patient um um have you got a <laughs> she, she was like yep and i'm like well actually i want to talk to you uh, about me um <laughs> and here's kind of like you know what's what's going on and she was amazing like she was incredibly open um and uh um yeah it was like it was life-changing for me i must say um but um so then we basically started to um you know trial some various different stimulant medications and 
uh, you know, along with her support and, and, and support of other people, um, it made it easier for me to now function again um, in a way that, you know, allowed me to do the things that I needed to do and, and not get frozen um, or, um, yeah, that still happens occasionally. That's, I think, it's just part of being a human being. But um, the stigma was um, probably one of the biggest barriers um, of, of, of seeking treatment uh, around that, yeah. And so... Well Sorry. Well, ultimately, this sounds like a like like a, a good story, and it illustrates a number of things. That um, uh, whereas I think if we go back a generation, uh, many mental health professionals would think, "Hey, look, if you're doing a PhD and functioning as well as you were, there's no way you'd have ADHD." Uh, like a, it makes it more difficult, for example, for people to complete secondary school. That might be one of the markers or, or signs at times of it. And yet you had that very high level of, of academic achievement. Uh, to get into a PhD program, there are many hurdles that people need to get through. You need you vetted a lot to get to that stage anyway, let alone completing the earlier degrees leading up to it. Uh, also things like being a, 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 a the capacity to be a, a chair of the uh, College of of clinical psychologists at, at state level again that that's a very high level position so it illustrates that someone can be actually functioning very well in many ways and yet um, have ADHD so I imagine that there would have been uh, like you're suggesting both a, a challenge as well I wonder about when you were given that diagnosis but as well some real advantages personal advantages of then knowing that that applied to you so i'm interested to hear what, what were some of those initial challenges apart from the stigma of of looking to raise that conversation in the first place but once you heard it confirmed yes you have adhd i wonder what that was like at least briefly at first but then also what advantages followed from that yeah um, there were a couple of things that you mentioned before that I wanted to touch on, but I've forgotten what they are now. So one of the and it, so this is not an advantage of ADHD is the <laughs> difficulty holding all of that information in mind. <laughs> um, but, um, so it might not help with me um, asking you double barrel questions. But the first well, thing, what was that like at first, having the diagnosis confirmed? Uh, I imagine it'd be challenging in some ways. Um, it was uh, uh, it was actually uh, really. Uh, it was mixed, and this is not something that I don't hear from my patients as well. And, oh, yes, I remember what it was now. So <laughs> just going back to that thing about, like, uh, somebody performing or being able to apparently uh, perform at a very high level, um, that is still um, a prevalent. That is not something that goes that has gone away yet. Or Because you, you, your people who are assessing and diagnosing this stuff, there's still a misconception around that. Like. Um, even in, in 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 terms of referrers and things like that, so uh, it, you know, educating people and, and having um, you know the right kind of training and opportunities to understand this in in a deeper level is really really important um, because it's not about uh, where you are; it's about where you could be for your own space, right? So, right. Um, so the, you know, if that's your ceiling and you've got ADHD, then what happens to the re rest of it? So people don't, you know, think about that. They're just, you know, comparing it to a, a group or, or, you know, against social norms or whatever that kind of might be. So, so I just wanted to make that point. Yes. Um, but to, um, to go back to your question, uh, it was mixed. Um, I was really happy. Um, um, and I was also really grief strucken as well, because, you know, for, I guess a lot of my life, um, you know, things haven't been easy. I, I, I haven't had an easy life. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, I guess it's kind of like, like what would have happened if uh, I had this sorted earlier? Like, uh, sorry, I'm getting a bit bloody emotional. <laughs> well, fair uh, enough. It's yeah. um, something that you would have dealt with for many years beforehand. And that's certainly something that we hear from not just clients, but friends in that situation. Yeah. So, so I guess, uh, uh, you know, and then I think about the challenges and, and everything, uh, you know, up until this point and, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for those challenges as difficult as they had been. Um, but also, you know, one thing about people with ADHD, 
um, is that they are tenacious. Like, they don't give up. You see people and uh, they won't give up. They, they're like a dog with a bone, whatever it is, right? And whether it's a challenge or whether whatever it might be at life, um, one of the strengths of people, I think, with ADHD, of like a character strength is that. Um, uh, you know, just don't lay down. And so, um, you know, that idea coupled with uh, the fact that I could uh, be reflective and be grateful for the challenges in my life to, you know, see me in uh, my life as I am now with the things and the people uh, that are in my life, uh, it was easier to, um, it was easier to make sense of. Yeah. And it's a, a story that I've heard before and, and thank you for being so honest with us as, as well about that too, Oz. And look, I'm sure there's people who are listening to this podcast who, who will feel exactly the same about their own experiences. And to me, it just highlights maybe the importance of what we were talking about before of really not trivializing ADHD as something, you know, to be used as an excuse to, you know, not take accountability over something. It, it Your example shows that, well, for, for people, there is, you know, some, some imposition in the way and it really is about, say, finding a way through that for them rather than, you know, looking for an excuse to not being able to do something a certain way. And so, yeah, I think it's a, a, a good example of why not to trivialise these things. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And I mean, I, I get why people may do that. Um, and I get why people in the same vein as OCD and things like that, because, you know, it's it. Yeah, yeah, people don't know, right? People don't understand. Um, and, and that's okay. Like, you know, not everyone, you can't expect everyone to know and understand everything. And so um, it's just about being more aware of this stuff so that we don't trivialize the challenges that people have, right? Um, so know, part the relationship. So oh, sorry, go on, go on. And so part of it, but being aware, as you say, um, I suppose then that does get back to also what were some of the advantages for you of having it confirmed? How did it make a difference? Uh, well, I, well, then since I, you know, have got the appropriate treatments and everything, well, I mean, it's made a massive difference in my life, like enormous. Um, and it's also made me, uh, you know, always, and I'm always doing this, um, because I kind of have to stay on top of myself, um, uh, making sure that I, uh, am, uh, you know, doing things that are going to help me um and not uh cause me grief <laughs> or distress even if it's things like organizing my day in a particular way or um whatever it might be uh you know one of the other advantages i guess is like um you know i i feel more uh comfortable um in being able to talk about it as a clinician uh and uh not not feel uh, impaired or anything like that. And I think it's kind of like, you know, I finished school in year 10. I, I didn't finish high school. And so, you know, when you when you have patients and, and people that come in and they're, they're kind of like struggled and things like that, I never, ever thought I would ever go to university, ever in my life. Um, and so, you know, it was my hope that I could, I guess, maybe be a bit more honest and give people uh maybe some people who may not have felt as hopeful historically to feel like maybe there's uh you know that there is kind of like a light at the end of the tunnel so uh, yeah and that that's uh look that's one of the things that we think is one of the best things about this podcast with you oz like your example and modeling that and the benefit that you've got with following through with treatment you highlighted there one of the main benefits of course i suppose of having it um diagnosed and confirmed is you've had access to um uh, uh, treatment now i presume that um medication can be a significant part of that um, would would you care to describe a bit um and i suppose informed by your personal experience but also by your clinical experience of the the relative role of, um, say, medication in uh, treatment and benefits of ADHD, um, along with any other kinds of interventions. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, just one more thing on that previous uh, comment yeah. as well. Um, just going back to that thing about stigma and about, you know, practitioners and 
things like that and not feeling comfortable or safe to be able to talk about difficulties. I think it's really important. And, um, you know, like all my team obviously know that I've got ADHD, so half my team have got ADHD, but, um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I really want to make it, uh, you know, so it's he's safe here for people to talk and also elsewhere. Like, you know, if there's difficulties, like go and get, don't, don't be scared to, you know, seek help. Um, you know, we all need help sometimes and, um, you know, getting it is, can, can be a game changer. So don't worry. Just do a, a, a great message. And, uh, look, something in my background is in my early thirties, I was hospitalized for depression. And at first I thought that might be a real blight on my career. It's been no real disadvantage whatsoever. Other people take you as they find you and, um, uh, coming through that process and learning what I needed to do to address that at the time, uh, is so many positives followed on from that. And, um, and I must admit, I haven't really experienced anything which has been a particular disadvantage in my career from acknowledging that. So I just think it's only to the advantage to be able to have informed people also who work in the field field who acknowledge their own personal experience and um yeah but i would be interested in uh, in your comments about uh, treatments or interventions in terms of medication relative to other kinds of uh, interventions yeah um like i think uh there's a lot of stigma around medication um you know i'm not a huge proponent for uh for medication generally but sometimes there is a place for it and actually a really important place and so uh, this is one of those occasions. Um, the first line of treatment for ADHD is stimulant medication. Why? It's because it works. It works, right? And so, um, you yeah, know, my, my colleague, uh, Lynn um, Bennett, she would always say, pills, then skills, because it's true. So if your brain is doing what it needs to do, um, as in, you know, if you imagine uh, a very busy intersection and there's no traffic lights and you've got chaos and carnage and, you know, people trying to cross the road, if you've ever been to any South uh, East Asian country and stuff like that, you can see, right? Um, and it's just, I'm like, how do you navigate this, right? For them, it works. Like, they're amazing. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't try it. Um, but it's it's almost like then putting, um, uh, you know, uh, sets of traffic lights and, you know, zebra crossings and a, and a, and a, and a conductor in that intersection because now all of a sudden people can actually go oh shit like i can think about one thought at a time instead of being bombarded by um you know useless noise uh, uh and, and of course the emotion regulation stuff too like it harms people people feel better generally um and so uh it's not the only answer but don't be afraid to try medication and there are several uh with different types of um ways in which they um in which they act so uh you know vivance will uh, is a bit different to concerta it's a bit different to ritalin etc and so sometimes you know if you um if you do end up going and you've got assessed and you're having a conversation with the psychiatrist really should be like we'll try this and then if it doesn't quite fit we'll try a different one and then titrate up and down as necessary because it is kind of like a process it's not just like here have some of those and off you go kind of thing um, I think that's really, really important. I don't think people should just throw out uh, the idea um, if, say, uh, Concerta wasn't working. It certainly didn't for me. I didn't like it at all. Um, but, you know, then I tried something else and it was much, much, it was much better. So um, so the role of stimulant medication is, um, is really important, really important uh, in this conversation. And... Um, the difference between that and um, say things like a tricyclic, uh, you know, other SSRIs or SNRIs or any other, um, uh, those types of medication is that um, it works straight away. Like you'll know within an hour, an hour and a half, there's not a period of three or four weeks uh, yeah, where you have to wait often with the other ones to see if there's any efficacy. It kind of, you'll know immediately pretty much. Um, um, and then it's got a very short half-life, so it's kind of like out of your system pretty quickly as well. So, um, you know, if somebody ha uh, is able to better regulate themselves, if they're able to collect their thoughts um, and actually be more present, uh, therapy is better. Therapy is easier with those patients too because they can actually do what we're, what we're moving towards doing. 
trauma processing becomes easier. And so uh, really kind of important considerations. Um, uh, on um, the skills side, uh, you know, I think being honest with yourself is um, like really a, a very important uh, part of that. And so uh, what I mean by that is like, know when you are your at your best so sometimes people are night people um so they were better at night time um, i'm not i'm a morning person and so my day starts at 4 30 as i get up it's quiet there's no one uh sending me uh, emails or calling me or uh um, you know knocking on the door or anything like that it's just i uh, and, and i can focus and i can get stuff done um, for a few hours before I, I come in here. So that's my best time and at the beginning of the week, right? But for some people, it might be different. It might be later in the week or it might be later in the evening or whatever. So it's about finding out what works best. Um, you know, uh, it, it, you said what are the some other strategies or some other things? Yes. Was it? That yeah, sure. And you, you, you started to talk about other... skills and you mentioned pills. Um, skills. So you're describing some of the skills, which also includes awareness of your own patterns, including through the day. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So like, you know, being aware of yourself, understanding your, um, you know, emotional responses, understanding, um, you know, how you work, how you operate um, and being honest in that is really, really important. Um, uh, like, you know, I know that, if I don't have uh, clear kind of parameters for what I'm doing, say I'm working on this thing at the moment, um, I know that I can't open up anything else because if I do that, then I go and open that up and then I open something else up and all of a sudden, you know, they've just gone down, you know, and they haven't really done anything productive, even though there's a lot of things to do. <laughs> Um, and so now all of a sudden it's a dog's breakfast, right? So, and that's what I mean about just being honest, like know yourself, uh, understand what uh, it is that you need. Um, you know, and another thing uh, is, you know, say for example, going to sleep. Um, if you have, if you have someone with ADHD and like I kind of, uh, you know, referred to before, uh, quiet sometimes is not good, right? It just stimulates too much. So actually, someone with ADHD um, might, you know, the, the skills or, you know, processes around that might be counterintuitive to what, you know, you might typically um, advise for sleep hygiene. Quiet, you know, calm, bed, you know, um, all of that kind of lovely stuff um, doesn't work. So actually, you need something to actually stimulate the brain, not too much, but enough. So, so it's like things like, for example, uh, you know, watching a show that you've seen heaps of times, right? So Friends, right? I'm just making this up. So you've seen Friends heaps of times, chucking that on, that's enough to keep your brain engaged, but not enough to uh, keep you stimulated enough to not go to sleep. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, listening to a podcast that you've listened to a few times that you're familiar with the content, so you're not getting engaged in it too much, but there's something there that kind of like is, uh, you know, helping to... Um, uh, capture the, the the noise or you know the brain's need to um, have some kind of uh, engagement <laughs> if that makes sense okay so some kind of focus without maybe being overstimulating and um, yeah. about for organizing oneself like I don't know use of calendars or oh, any yeah. apps or well, well, what kind of things might help that way oh my word okay so <laughs> um <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out, <laughs> um, but I'm doing my absolute best. And I, I guess like what I uh, try and do um, with with that is um, everything goes into a calendar, everything, like everything has to go into my calendar. And so um, appointments and, and, and all that type of thing, thing, because I, you know, otherwise I will forget to do something. And forgetting is not like, oh my God, there's something wrong with you. It just is what it is. So like, you know, people who are a bit more forgetful than others, um, uh, this is part of that being honest with yourself. It is what it is. Okay. So what do we do about it? Well, we put things in our diaries so we don't forget, right? Um, it's more like self and like acceptance, a bit of, a bit of compassion around uh, the things that aren't your strengths. Um, and 
So putting in uh, things in the calendar is really important. Um, I have a to-do, like a planner um, that I have um, my my team will add uh, things that I need to do there with documents attached so that it's accessible to me so I don't have to go fishing around for things. Um, so whatever is going to make uh, you uh, get from A to B in the with the least amount of resistance, like that's the most important thing. So making things as streamlined as possible um, and, uh, um, again, like, this is very individual. Some people use Pomodoro timers, um, you know, for, uh, you know, what a Pomodoro timer is? It? No, I don't uh, actually. Oh, okay. So, so there's a whole bunch of different ways of using this is a pretty cool thing, but basically it's a, it's a timer that will, um, you know, go for however long you set it for, maybe 15 minutes. Um, and then you'll have two minute break and it'll give you, make a noise and, uh, and then, you know, it'll start another 15 minutes. So you, for that 15 minutes, you focus on the thing that you're focusing on. You can set it for however long you want. They're pretty good, actually. Um, uh, so you get some really clever ones, like for your phone, where um, it's uh, like a, tr a tree. And if you don't, don't touch your tree, if you touch your phone, all of the leaves die on, on, the, on the, so then you start again. So it kills the tree if you touch your phone. Um, like things like that, pretty cool. Um, so those things work for, for, for people. Um, uh, and uh, I guess another bit of advice is, I guess do the do the smallest thing, right? Just do the first most easiest thing, the most easiest part of that task. Um, for example, uh, it's very easy to get overwhelmed with the idea of having to write a report, for example. With a huge report to write, and I will avoid that like the plague because I know that uh, um, I don't really want to do it. <laughs> um, and uh, often it will be right at the last minute because that is when my brain gets all the dopamine because I'm really anxious because now I've got a deadline and I have to do it, otherwise I'm going to be embarrassed or whatever. And so that's why people like will do their assignments later you know, because their brain now gets stimulated enough to be, oh, my God, an aura of an effort and all, all the good stuff, right? So um, if I think about just starting that task, I'll be like, okay, so my only job right now is to switch on my computer. That is the most simple first step that I can take to moving towards that task. And making uh, commitments literally that small. And you think, well, I've turned the computer on. I might, I might just open and open up the document. Just to open up the document. That's my only goal. And if you decide to walk away at that point, that is okay. Do you get what I mean? Yes. I'm, yes. If I open up the document, I may as well just skim over or whatever. I'll have a look at the questions that I'm being asked. Yeah. And now all of a sudden... All of a sudden, I'm engaged in the thing that I've been absolutely avoiding forever because all I needed to do was take that very first, very basic step towards towards that uh, goal. Yeah. Yes, and taking the pressure off the whole thing. So managing expectations in that way. One of the things I like about that is it overlaps with a, a general approach to dealing with difficult problems. Um a friend of ours, a psychologist who's been on the podcast, David Cherry, he often talks about problem solving in a challenging situation. Is he might ask, he might ask the person, what's the what's the smallest thing that you can do that might make a difference? Hmm. This might be with some life problem or challenge generally. Breaking down the expectations, what's something you can do that makes a difference, that might make a difference? And you're uh, describing that quite specifically in terms of, yes, yeah, starting a task. It might be sitting at a desk. It might be turning the computer on and not giving yourself a hard time when you're doing that. And who knows, you might go on to the next step or it might help something else unfold. But I like that way of, um, yeah, encouraging people to help get a start uh, when otherwise that might be very difficult to do. And and I guess the, the other thing um, that's, uh, there's, I don't know, uh, I'm sure many people have found this, but, you know, I'll just use the example of a report because it's um, salient, but sometimes you're sitting there and uh, 
you, know, you might spend four hours or three hours. I remember like doing research papers and I would literally, I'm not even joking, there'd be times where I'd write two sentences in four hours. Um, and, you know, when you think about that, it's kind of like debilitating because you're there and you're like, oh, my God, like, yeah. And you're giving yourself a hard time. You're such an idiot. Why can't you just do this thing? It's so simple. It's not that hard, right? And your brain just doesn't want to cooperate. Stop. Don't do it. But you make a commitment to go back later. Maybe it might be that day. It might be again the next day, right? Have another crack at it. But there's no point uh, sitting there. And this is not like a let off right this is because it's still there are responsibilities that need to obviously be met <laughs> um but there's no point uh, sitting there looking at something and spending four hours of your life which then subsequently leads to like excessive self-criticism and and everything else and in that in that flow on effect so stop do something else um whether it's related to that or not whether it's going for a bike ride or i don't know whatever it might be um and give yourself permission uh, to be okay with doing that. Yeah. And it strikes me as well, Oz, that, you know, I think as we're learning a little bit more about, say, the the scale of neurodiversity or the spectrum of neurodiversity and, and neurodivergence as well, is that everyone, or as you're describing, is probably going to have their own recipe in some ways. And so I think that seems like such a big part of it in terms of maybe taking the pressure off to do things a certain way. And like, I even came across something reason, uh, recently, it's, it was a website called, I think, goblin.tools. And we'll put, put that up on the, the podcast page for today. But it's basically a website, and I believe it's for basically people with ADHD. And you type in a task that you need to do, and you can set their sort of, for lack of a better term, kind of difficulty level. So you can put it on one end where you, you type in a task and you get literally a kind of broken down set of instructions for kind of every little minute thing that you might need to do. So if it's, you know, cooking chicken, for example, it's where you've got to open the fridge, you've got to take the chicken out of the fridge, you've got to, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. And whereas, you know, it might be as much as, you know, get the chicken in the oven might be a sort of the other end of the spectrum where it's a little less detailed. So it strikes me that in today's day and age, partly as we're learning a little bit more about this sort of stuff, but partly due to the nature of technology and, you know, even, you know, there's a whole bunch of say entrepreneurs and stuff out there who have their systems of working and of efficiency and this sort of stuff. And it seems that, well, there's plenty of information out there, but it really is just about finding a bit of a recipe that works for you and and maybe even leaning on some of the, the technologies that do exist, not judging yourself for that and just realizing that, yeah, it's absolutely fine to find your own recipe. So there should be no pressure to do things a certain way. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's, everyone's uh, journey is uh, individual and there's lots of resources. And so that's just part of that sort of, uh, finding what works for you. Um, Attitude Magazine is another fantastic resource I think people should uh, uh, draw on because they've got podcasts and uh, things you can, you know, resources you can download and um, uh, and, and lots of other useful things. Um, so I would definitely, you know, maybe put that uh, as a resource as well, Attitude Magazine. Very good. Mm. Great. There's a, there's a lot that uh, you're describing that comes down to things like awareness, experimenting, seeing what works for you, being honest with yourself. A lot of things that um, we've discussed also very much apply to an individual level, a person looking to deal with their own reactions. Now, one thing I'd be interested to hear from you is potentially how ADHD might impact on relationships. And part of the reason I'm bringing this up, I think it gets back to what you said earlier about emotion regulation. I can think of one fellow I saw at first we met in relation to burnout and depression. And as that resolved, it became clear that there were still some other difficulties there. And it emerged that it seemed more like an ADHD pattern. Now, it seemed to me that uh, there were a number of times that person would experience conflict in his relationship with his wife and he's not trying to piss her off, so to speak, or act in ways that would be annoying or frustrating or whatever. But at times, the way that he'd deal with certain situations or respond to certain situations that may have been influenced by ADHD at times led him to act in ways that I think would have been quite frustrating for his partner. 
Now, I'm wondering at first how ADHD might manifest at times in relationships. And, and later on, I'll ask you also about what it might help partners to understand about ADHD, also to recognise that the person's not like intending to do things to, that might frustrate them or whatever. Sometimes it is difficult for that person to inhibit a certain reaction or whatever. But first of all, what do you notice about how ADHD might uh, manifest itself or influence relationships? Hmm. Have you been speaking to my wife? <laughs> uh, I haven't actually, but I suspect this might be a widespread issue. And so, as psychologists, we, can, as psychologists, we often focus on the individual. <laughs> but it happens in the context, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that's a, I guess, I guess that's a, how can I answer that question? Um, you don't have to self incriminate yourself either, Ops. Uh, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, um, so, uh, where, where can I start? Um, well, I imagine it's a fairly complex issue at times to start. I imagine that's one thing to acknowledge. Can you repeat, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, but sure. so, so if, the, the important part of the question. Yeah, so if someone has ADHD, how might that sometimes influence how they react in their families or with partners or whatever. I imagine sometimes this could be misunderstood, but I imagine that there are ways that people might react that might be, I don't know, impulsive or something like that, 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 um, that might make things more complicated and could be misinterpreted. Yeah, sure. So there's, uh, I guess there's lots of maybe different ways of uh, considering that. So firstly, if you think about, the idea of uh, emotion regulation difficulties. Um, so people may be more emotionally reactive or, um, you know, sensitive. Um, we know that people with ADHD are more generally prone to higher rejection sensitivity, to higher justice sensitivity. And uh, when people are a bit more aware of that, and it makes sense as well, like if you're a child and um, you're constantly uh, being told that you're doing the wrong thing and you're being punished for it and they're being told off, you're going to be hypersensitive to criticism and and and, and things like that. So you, you know, it's kind of like a bit of a symbiotic relationship, um, which I can talk a bit about later on. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, pe people may be a bit more sensitive to, you know, perceived criticism or per per perceived rejection within a relationship. Um, which can then cause obviously instability. Uh, um, when people are feeling overwhelmed with emotion, it's very difficult to be reasoned. Um, and so uh, often, you know, um, that might cause problems too because people are having difficulty with communication. Um, another, I guess, consideration around that is <laughs> this is a complaint that I get uh, a lot, and I think. Um, uh, I'm not pretty sure I'm not the only one. Um, people with ADHD uh, think big. They think about big things. Um, that is something that I want to go and get, right? And the problem, though, is that if you imagine a ladder, uh, there are a few rungs in the ladder that are missing. And so, <laughs> so we can't really get to the top of the ladder um, because the finer details haven't been ironed out. And that can be really frustrating for people, Um you know, like it can be really frustrating for, uh, say, um, you know, if you've got sort of a, a few different ideas in mind and people are trying to follow and they're, they're kind of like, just ask my practice manager, um, they're trying to follow uh, what process or what to focus on, you know, what's the most important thing. You know, sometimes it feels like everything's the most important thing. Right? That's, an, that's an ADHD thing, right? Um, so, uh, you know, that can um, cause communication problems. That can cause, um, you know, um, uh, other issues like that because uh, I guess it's sometimes might, might make it difficult to, for people to be on the same page or, or even as much as you want to be. And so that's another thing that, you know, requires self-awareness, that attention, um, uh, almost like an attunement to recognise when those things are happening. Um, uh, or if, <laughs> if you're like talking, to, <laughs> speaking to your wife or partner or whatever it might be, um, 
uh, you know, you might be having a conversation and uh, sometimes you tune out, like it's, it's, uh, that's like part of that, part of that thing. You might be thinking about like all of these other things. And it's not that, you know, what the person is saying is not important. Like it is important. Um, but you know, the attention is then, you know, kind of like captured elsewhere and, and parts of things. And, and then you can be, uh, people can be considered as inconsiderate or, you know, you're not listening or you don't care. Um, and I've got much better at that one. Um, and so, so, uh, so, uh, things like that, you know, um, so does that answer your question? Yes. I think that's a really good example. Like for example, tuning out a bit and tending to tune out a little bit more, and again, I can think of this other situation that when a partner recognized that in that case, her husband had ADHD, it was helpful in not um, over-interpreting the person's intentions as being negative. For example, if someone's inattentive and you factor in, look, it doesn't mean that they don't care or they're just not interested in anything that you say, just the way they brain the person's brain works, they might be tuning out a little bit more. So allow for that prospect a bit further. Or maybe if someone's taking um, longer to get started at doing something, or maybe if they start off with a maybe an overambitious goal, it's not to make excuses for things, but just to recognise how people might process yeah. things differently because it, it helps maybe to not misinterpret intentions. And I think that example of emotional regulation as well, like uh, I can remember a situation where someone might, be dare I say a bit oversensitive or, or, or react strongly in certain situations and 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 rather than that person having any negative intention if you like it was their initial reaction and and when that person recognized they had ADHD mind you they were able to pay a little bit more attention to things that they could, could do to manage that a bit better. And so I think we're not talking about making an excuse, but making allowances for sometimes people reacting in ways that are suboptimal, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they intend to frustrate their partner or just they're not listening to them or something like that. It's just, I think, factoring it in. And I suppose I'll just maybe ask you that. Do, do you notice times uh, where someone's been diagnosed with, uh, with ADHD? Do you get a sense sometimes that their family members do understand a little bit more, dare I say, and maybe be a little bit more understanding or accepting of certain situations not making excuses, but it makes it a little bit easier to maybe recognize where someone's coming from. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm I, I, I'm hearing what you're saying. There was but just a little... so I suppose um, uh, what I'm saying. Is <laughs> I, I imagine some... my previous comment. I just kind of got a little bit. Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. Look. Look, I think it, I think the way I'd say it is sometimes it might help for partners as well. If someone's diagnosed with ADHD, it can help uh, the partners too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so I guess um, uh, even just kind of like going back to um, you know the previous examples, you know, uh, going to Bunnings. Uh, so I'm just going to go to Bunnings. I'll be back in a few minutes, and all of a sudden it's like an hour and a half or two hours, and you. will Five minutes, ten minutes. What happens? <laughs> so, so, so that time blindness. Um, and oh, look at that shiny thing over there. Oh, maybe I could use this new spanner, right? Or <laughs> whatever it might be. Um, and then having multiple projects around the house, and then not having not finished. I, I'm not. I'm pretty good with that actually. Um, but uh, but it's not uncommon for people to have that sort of you know. And so they, then there might be mess or things are incomplete, and then people get frustrated uh, in their relationships. Um, the Understanding a bit, I think, is helpful for um, partners for sure. I think it can lead to a uh, more, um, I guess, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a more common and shared understanding of a particular thing, which gives way for uh, a bit more of a compassionate position um, definitely uh, depending on how uh, the partner may perceive mental health or if they accept mental health as a as being okay or not um, if that makes sense uh, and I guess 
just because that is true, um, you know, people also need to take responsibility for that because when you know something, um, uh, you know, it's not your fault. It's not people's fault that they may have a difficulty or a challenge. But if you know uh, about that and you don't do something about it, then that's kind of like your responsibility. Um, and so as with that, so like honesty uh, about uh, honesty with yourself, uh, understand any your limitations, being okay with those and uh, making sure that you are putting things in place in your life, in your relationships to help mitigate those and to enhance um, the good bits, the better bits. Yeah. And it strikes me, Oz, with that that answer there, but with so much that you've said today that there can be just so much benefit in getting a diagnosis, a, a proper clinical diagnosis. And what I wonder then is, for example, in, in Victoria, and I assume the rest of Australia too, that the waiting lists for treatment and for diagnoses for ADHD is, well, it, it's a lot more popular now in terms of looking for that assessment. And what I wonder is, is do you have any tips for maybe someone waiting for an assessment or waiting for, for treatment for ADHD as well? And they might have something booked in the future, but up until that point of maybe getting it confirmed or finding a little bit more about their own individual circumstances, what are you, some thoughts that you have maybe on, on what people can do to, well, maybe help themselves in that situation and, and yeah, maybe alleviate some of the issues that can come up? Um, I guess uh, if you're not already kind of like seeing a, you know, the psych um, and um, you're waiting for an assessment or, or things like that, you know, like utilizing those resources like Attitude Magazine um, and things like that, just so you can get a much sounder, much greater understanding of like your own symptoms, um, you know, hearing other people uh, talk about their own experiences um, and uh, you know, the people's experiences in different contexts, like, for example, ADHD and relationships and things like that can be really helpful and normalizing for a person. And so um, so that's what I would encourage people to do, whether they're in treatment or not, actually. Um, you know, on our website, we've got links to YouTube videos uh, that kind of like um, uh, speak to some of that stuff. And then people can go and do their own kind of thing, right? But uh, yeah, I think it's just important for people to just be curious about uh, what's going on for them, try and understand it in a, in a deeper way. Um, and you know, the skill stuff you can also get from uh, those resources. Uh, you can, you know, an ADHD coach actually would uh, be helpful if that's available or if there's, if there are any around. Um, they can certainly help with uh, sort of the organizational things and helping um, understand a little bit about what's going on, what you need to implement to make life easier. Um, so that, that would kind of like be my recommendations. Yeah. I was, I was just going to say, sorry, it, it strikes me as well. It's it's maybe never too early to start building that particular individual recipe that we have too. And even for maybe people who don't have ADHD necessarily, but still recognize maybe some aspects of some of the symptoms in themselves, like it, it can only really be a good thing, it seems, to maybe have a bit of a play around and look to maybe curate some of our processes and systems that's going to make things a bit easier for us. Yeah. And I guess just going back to that as well, like, um, that might be helpful to do as well, um, like finding those resources and, and trying to, I guess, whether you have ADHD or not, like if you, can, you can improve or plan better and all that. I mean, that's always going to be helpful, right? Um, but it's really important that unless or until you've had a, you know, really thorough assessment, until you've kind of like had some confirmation and some uh, really, I guess, like professional input into uh helping a person understand what could be going on, what could be some of the factors that are uh, implicating, um, you know, or causing problems in people's lives, um, to be careful not to over-identify with something um, uh, because uh, then um, that can cause its own problems, if that makes sense. And so typically the assessment will involve, um, as I understand, seeing a psychiatrist, but as a starting point, what comments do you have about people, for example, approaching their GP or talking to a psychologist? What are some general things? And we'll certainly have a link to your website there, Oz, but what are some of your suggestions at first if people around Australia, for example, or even elsewhere are thinking of looking to get some further help in this area? Yeah. 
Um, so I think, uh, so actually the psychiatrist is not necessary for an ADHD diagnosis. A clinical psychologist can diagnose that um, and a uh, clinical neuropsychologist in Dev, I think as well. Um, uh, I, don't quote me, there might be some others. Um, but basically, uh, you know, people uh, may come here from a referral from a psychiatrist. So we get referrals from psychiatrists to help differentiate sometimes. Um, and then we'll have people who will, will um, refer and they'll come through from a GP. Um, but uh, so often it'll be a, do you want me to talk about the process or? Just, just briefly, kind of, give people a little bit of an idea might, practically of what it might involve to slightly demystify it. Because a lot of people, as I understand, are seeking help and finding it months to book in to see someone I suppose um, that, that's a challenge that is a, that is a bit, a bit difficult to get around, unfortunately. Um, but if I'm going to talk a little bit about the process, you know, what it should, what I believe it should um, include, it should be a very thorough uh, history, developmental history, um, current symptoms, family, uh, you know, family symptoms, um, you know, uh, head injuries, really, really important to know about and um, any other kind of medical conditions or psychiatric um, difficulties, uh, genetic or otherwise. Um, and um, uh, understanding a person's real, like having a really un good understanding of their symptoms. Um, and so we give people a, like a you know, big battery of questionnaires that look at all different kinds of things, ASD, trauma, um, you know, OCD, lots of things that overlap with um, ADHD because, um, you know, the comorbidities for ADHD uh, people with ADHD uh, will 70% of the time at least have two comorbid other difficulties. Um, it's incredible, right? So, uh, you know, you need, you need to be able to like, identify those and actually be able to, like, help because when it comes to recommendations, um, if, in fact, there's OCD and uh, there's there might be ADHD, likely... But we need to kind of like go, well, actually, the OCD is the most impairing thing at the moment. So we need to see what happens after treatment. And then um, and it's likely that the ADHD might be there. And so um, it's about making appropriate recommendations around what's the most important thing, um, you know, what the assessment might show is the most important thing. And here uh, we have our clinical neuropsychologists do all of the ADHD assessments. We are, So... Um, and then if there's a sort of an extra complexity or it's a, a more uh, complex mental health kind of uh, uh, confounding variable, then, you know, a clean psych might do a brief interview with the person as well um, to sort of corroborate and get um, get some clarity around that. So uh, uh, that's, that's, that's the process here. Other people do it in different kind of ways. Um, and then ob obviously... Uh, uh, pharmacological treatment will be, uh, you know, from a psychiatrist. Um, though I think at the moment they're reviewing some of that stuff in terms of, um, you know, what that might look like in a year or two. Um, but the GPs can often co-prescribe now, so to take the pressure off the psychiatrist. So you can go to the psychiatrist, have the assessment, um, have contact, but the GP then becomes the regular uh, go-to to make it more accessible for people. Uh, Sorry, yes, also, the, the, that's a very helpful clarification. It might have been misleading, how I said it earlier, but certainly um, uh, uh, clinical psychs, neuropsychs who, who have particular expertise in that area can be very expert uh, uh, at diagnosing ADHD, like in, in your clinic. But uh, yeah, what I was thinking of, typically there'll be a psychiatrist involved in the medication prescription and treatment, certainly at this stage. And for many people that would apply. But as you're saying, there might be some scope later on for for uh, GPs and also GPs may be co-prescribing, but it's when people are seeking medication or receiving medic, um, medication as part of treatment, that will tend to inv uh, involve a, a psychiatrist. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And you want to go to a psychiatrist who's, um, you know, knowledgeable in ADHD or has expertise in that area, um, because then you're going to get somebody who actually really understands what's happening for you and um, and can give you the most appropriate treatment. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. 
It's a very helpful, Osnat. Now, look, at this point, it's really um, whether there'd, there'd be anything else that you'd like to add, but but maybe something that we might have underestim- uh, uh, underemphasized as well is that there are uh, 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 a number of advantages that people sometimes can find that go with also having a certain, well, if we call it a condition, ADHD, or have you, your brain might work differently in some ways, but there are some advantages that go with that. Often it's thought with ADHD, there can be a hyper ability, so people can be very persistent at following through on areas of, of interest. But, um, but, but I might, um, again, let, leave it to you if you'd make any comments about that, of, about things that you notice where you appreciate, in a sense, your brain working differently with some advantages that go with that as well. Yeah. Um, no, that's a really good question. Um, there's actually, let me just uh, get that up because I was reading it earlier today. Um, there is a study, I can send it to you if you like. Um, this is okay. really nice, a really nice study. Um, I just want to get the name right so I don't insult the person. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can put this up on the podcast page at psychspills.com.au. So that works out. Well. Oh, yeah, you. yeah. Um, uh, Shippers uh, and colleagues, um, a qualitative and quantitative study of self reported positive characteristics of individuals with ADHD. It's a really nice paper. Um, it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's a research paper. So um, but it's it you know it's written relatively you know, in a in a relatively digestible way. Um, but they uh, really speak to some of the wonderful qualities uh, that people with ADHD uh, have, and you you know talking about things like creativity, um, flexibility, uh, you know higher energy. The the hyper focus stuff I'll comment in, on in a sec in a second. But you know because of that. Uh, you know, emotional sensitivity. Um, you know, people uh, with ADHD are often more empathic or who are really pro-social. Um, you know, they're often more socially uh, uh, outgoing, uh, spontaneous, right? So, you know, sometimes spontaneity, impulsiveness is actually really cool. It's a cool thing to do because, you know, you have um, often sometimes people might be even more cautious around pursuing, um, uh, you know, uh, obviously that kind of like fits in with novelty seeking and, and stuff like that right like so there are benefits to some of that stuff you can obviously get you into trouble as well but um but um you know and and what you find actually is uh people with ADHD are often you know um pretty intelligent people like uh and, and that's another one of the things that you kind of another one that indicators so you've got somebody who's like really intelligent and they're doing something that is kind of like um uh, at, not at their potential. I mean, this is really big mismatch. You like, like, how come? Like, uh, uh, it's just, people just haven't been given the opportunity or um, had the scaffolding to reach a potential that they they could have otherwise or can still. Um, but that's another one of the indicators that kind of like, you're a very smart person. You're doing this kind of thing, so I'm just wondering what's happening here. Uh, um, the hyper focus thing, you know, that can be. Oh, and also very creative. I'm not sure if I said that. With ADHD people are very creative um, uh, in, in lots and lots of different ways. That, you know, people, they like working with their hands, um, you know, and often in the arts and things like that. So uh, hyperfocus uh, is an interesting one. I think hyperfocus can be really, really helpful, um, but it can be also really damaging. You know, if you're hyper focused on something that is helpful and useful and that is actually serving you, um, that's fantastic. Um, if you're hyper focused on your anxious thoughts, um, or if you're hyper focused on uh, a video game, or if you're hyper focused on uh, something that you're procrastinating on instead of actually doing your response, doing the thing that you need to do, um, you know, that can cause really significant problems in life. And I think you know people need people need to consider that in a different way. I think. Um, uh, yes, it can be a, no, it's a double-edged sword. It can be a superpower, but it can also be extremely debilitating. Um, and then it just kind of comes back down to that thing about understanding yourself, being honest with yourself and, you know, putting in scaffolding, uh, based on that information so that you can, um, you know, maximize the really good bits <laughs> and, um, mitigate the not so good bits. <laughs> yeah. It, it strikes me that that, that can be maybe be something with a lot of maybe some of the symptoms of ADHD as well in terms of there's almost this kind of positive aspect to it and maybe this negative aspect to it and certainly not wanting to to trivialize 
some of the difficulties that can come with ADHD, but I even think about, you know, some of my friends and people who I've met who've been explicit about the fact that they have ADHD and so often they're just thoroughly interesting people. Like you say, you know, they're creative. They've got a real energy about them. That's kind of infectious to be around. Uh, Often they're so empathetic. They're well, very interested in a lot of things, maybe if there is this kind of hyper focus aspect to it. So without necessarily wanting to uh, to trivialize it uh, or even resourcefulness, of course, is another one in terms of uh, the ways that they've been able to, to navigate things for themselves. It strikes me that, yeah, that, that there can be so many benefits. Well, you know, for, for a very kind of selfish perspective of, of being friends with someone who has ADHD and, and multiple people as well. And yeah, it, it just strikes me that, yeah, there is really that positive aspect to being around people with ADHD and maybe having a mix of people in your circles who, who can, I suppose, provide some of whether it be that energy, creativity, uh, yeah, resourcefulness. It, there is that aspect to it as well. Yeah, like, I mean, if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, um, you know, if you're, or, um, you know, if you're in a cave and you're kind of, you know, needing to forage for food and all of that kind of stuff, I absolutely want to have ADHD as opposed to not, um, because that is going to help me survive um, because of all of that stuff, because of the, um, you know, the drive, the curiosity, the willingness to explore. Um, and, you know, often you find people with ADHD are, um, you know, in the services, uh, their first responders, they're in the military and things like that because of that sort of, uh, you know, moving towards uh, moving towards uh, action, so to speak, as opposed to away from it. Um, so it's very, very common um, in, in, in those kind of professions as well. Yeah. Well, I think that's a pretty good note to be winding up on. And before Rowan um, winds it up, winds us up, I'd just like to say I was just wonderful to have uh, your description and highlighting things like awareness honesty, all the rest of it, that I, I just think that you've modelled so well through this conversation as as well uh, in, t- in terms of talking about your own experience as well, but also you've brought many insights from the great experience that you have in this area. And, uh, and it also strikes me that it's just an encouraging story that someone who has experienced some of the downsides and disruptive impacts of ADHD can have recently completed a, a doctorate, you run your group psychology practice, you've contributed significantly to the Australian Psychological Society in your role as a, a chair of the State Clinical College. There are all sorts of things that you've done and achieved in many different areas. And I think that's a bit of an uplifting story in itself. So thank you very much for joining us that way. I think it's been very enlightening. Well, certainly. And, and thank you so much for your honesty um, as well, Oz. It's it, it's such a, I think, important topic and one that we are learning a little bit more about as time goes on. I, I saw something before we jumped on today that so in our region, I believe associated with the NDIS, there's 58% more, or well, I suppose, diagnosed people with ADHD who are accessing NDIS benefits than 12 months ago. So it just suggests that there is a a growing prevalence as we learn more about ADHD. And I suppose even just a, a little example that I've come across recently is I'm not sure if you've seen the TV show Bluey. It's a, a kid's show. It's a, a wonderful Australian kids show. And there's a character on there, I believe Jack's his name, Jack Russell. And it's just a, a really nice portrayal of ADHD, which I'd, I'd even suggest everyone if they're interested to check out. But it just strikes me that maybe say 10, 15 years ago, maybe Bart Simpson would have been one of the most prominent, say, TV characters who you'd kind of associate a little bit with ADHD. And, and now I think we are learning a little bit more about it and maybe seeing some more positive examples of, of all these kind of positive traits that we're talking about and and obviously yourself with everything that you've done and and your willingness to speak about it and your honesty is is going to contribute to that so thank you so much for coming on to our podcast and and being able to share your experiences and your knowledge with all of our listeners and i'm sure there'll be many people listening to this who will relate to it in in some way and and will receive great benefit from hearing what you have to say so thank you very much oz yes thank you oz uh, th- thank you both. It's been a real pleasure th- and, and a privilege. I uh, really value and appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and um, you know and t- talk about this stuff with you guys. So thank you so much for having me on.
And as I mentioned before, we will put all the resources for today's episode up at sykespills.com.au. So thank you once again, Oz. It's been really enjoyable having this chat. Thank, thank you. you.